In this video, we're going to talk about why we see bradycardia in pediatric patients when they become hypoxic. And in order to understand this, we first need to talk about the differences in our cardiac output equation for our pediatric patients. So we know that cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. And we know the core difference here for the pediatric patient is that they are highly dependent on heart rate. So they have a harder time not only relying on stroke volume, their stroke volume tends to be more fixed in nature. So we see a fixed stroke volume and they have a really hard time actually increasing increasing stroke volume in order to compensate. And this is what can lead to severe decompensation when we see bradycardia in pediatric patients, which is a concern when we know that under hypoxic conditions, the pediatric patient is at high risk of bradycardia. So there are a couple of things that are impacting this or why we see this fixed or low stroke volume in these patients. And one is that they just simply have a decreased number of myofibrils. So we see a decreased number of myofibrils available, which means that we're going to have less contractile units in the heart. And we know the other piece to this is that they're simply not as organized. So we should have a fairly organized myofibril that's going to allow for strong contraction. And that's just not what we see in the pediatric patient. We have less organization of these myofibrils, a less organized sarcoplasmic reticulum, and as a result, we have weaker contraction. So it's just harder for uh, this patient to have strong contraction. So we have a decreased number of myofibrils as well as poor organization of these contractile uh, units. So again, the important thing about this is that these two factors together make it more challenging for these patients to generate stroke volume and more uh, challenging for these patients to respond with an increase in cardiac output through stroke volume when they need to compensate. So as a result, they rely primarily on heart rate. And that is exactly what we see is the pediatric patient has typically a higher heart rate. Now, some issues come into play here when we start to see bradycardia and we know that these patients are prone to bradycardia in the hypoxic setting. So now that we have an appreciation for why pediatric patients are so reliant on heart rate. So we know that they have a decreased number of myofibrils, poor organization of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and these contractile units, which means they rely on heart rate, well, this becomes very impactful then in the hypoxic setting when the patient becomes bradycardic. And unfortunately, the pediatric patient is more prone to bradycardia when they become hypoxic. And there are a number of different reasons for this. One, not uncommon or not unlike the adult patient, when we have hypoxia, we start to see myocardial dysfunction. And we see this myocardial dysfunction for a few reasons. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw in a myocardial cell. So we'll say that this blue uh, round dot here is a myocardial cell. We know that there are a few really important functions. One of the important functions of this cell is the production of ATP. So we need ATP production in order to have the functioning of the pumps that exist within, within the cell. And when we're talking about cells, we know that there are a few really important ones. One of the important pumps that is going to exist here is the sodium potassium pump, which is responsible for pumping sodium out of our cell once we've had a action potential and for pumping potassium back into the cell. So this is essentially what is giving us repolarization, which makes the absolute refractory period or the relative refractory period end and allows for the patient to be able to have another action potential. So the sodium potassium pump is essential to reestablishing the chemical gradients that we see in the myocardial cell and allowing us to have another action potential. Another really important pump that is going to exist for this patient is the calcium pump, which allows the pumping, pumping of calcium into the cell, which is responsible for the plateau phase of our action potential and is what's giving us the ability to have the physical force of contraction. Calcium binds to troponin and is going to allow for that. So what happens in hypoxia, when we start to have hypoxia, and again, the pediatric patient is more susceptible to this than the adult patient, is we start to see failure of the production of ATP. So the critical piece here is that we start to see a reduction in ATP production. And the problem is that ATP is the fuel for these pumps. So the ATP is necessary for these pumps to work. So as a result, we start to see failure of these pumps. So one of the first things that we see is decreased function of the sodium potassium pump. And this is going to have a few consequences for this patient. If I can't have functioning of the sodium potassium pump, one of the things I start to see is an increase in intracellular sodium. While we have an increase in extracellular potassium.
And the problem with this is that we essentially do not reestablish or repolarize the membrane. So what happens here is we do not get repolarization. And if we don't have repolarization, or if we do not have sodium making its way out of the cell, potassium becoming the predominant intracellular ion, what happens is we have failure of our sodium channels in order to have a subsequent depolarization, so decreased function of our sodium channels. If you think about this, it is very similar. So this reduced function of sodium channels is basically going to prolong a relative refractory period or prolong a refractory period, which means we will have a lot, it will take longer to return to normal resting membrane potential, and we will have a decreased ability to have an action potential and a reduction in heart rate. So we see a slower return to our normal resting mem membrane potential, which will lead to bradycardia or can lead to bradycardia for these patients. The other consequence that we're going to get, get or we're going to see as a result of decreased ATP production is failure of our uh, calcium pump. So we start to see failure of the calcium pump as well. So the first thing we see is failure of the potassium, sodium potassium pump. The other thing we're going to see is reduced function of our calcium pump, which means we're going to have slower entry of calcium into the cell, which means we're not going to have as forceful contraction. It can actually prolong our action potentials. As a result, what we can see is a decrease in troponin binding and slower action potentials. which also can contribute to this patient's bradycardia. Now, the problem here is that this is not the only reason why this patient is prone to bradycardia. The other piece has to do with the function of the autonomic nervous system in the pediatric patient. So what I'm going to use here is yellow to show the parasympathetic nervous system. So in the parasympathetic nervous system for these patients, we typically have a more well-developed system. So we're going to see intervention or vagal intervention. The other core problem that we're going to see in pediatric patients that's going to contribute to this is underdevelopment of the sympathetic nervous system. And favoring of the parasympathetic nervous system. So what we'll do here is I'm going to draw in the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. So from our medulla, we're looking at our vagus nerve. So we'll look at the vagal nerve intervention on this patient in yellow here. So this is the parasympathetic nervous system. Specifically, we're looking at vagal intervention. And I'll use green to indicate the sympathetic nervous system. And what we find is that we have a more sparsely developed sympathetic nervous system, and we don't nearly have as much sympathetic nervous system development. So this will be our sympathetic nervous system, which we have a reduction or less development in. So what this means is twofold, is one, that this patient will favor parasympathetic nervous system activity. So one of the things that we see in terms of homeostasis is this patient favors the parasympathetic nervous system over the sympathetic nervous system. So that means we typically just have more sympathetic nervous system tone. The other thing that this means for this patient is that the sympathetic nervous system is typically more susceptible to hypoxia. So we have autonomic nervous system that favors the parasympathetic nervous system over the sympathetic nervous system. We have a sympathetic nervous system that's more susceptible to hypoxia. So that means it's going to function more poorly when we see hypoxia. And the last thing that we see is that our central chemoreceptors will actually send signals to the medulla to promote an increase in vagal tone in the setting of hypoxia because of this. So if we have an underdeveloped sympathetic nervous system, if we think about the adult patient, we typically would release catecholamines, increase sympathetic nervous system tone in the presence of hypoxia hypoxia in order to increase cardiac output, in order to increase respiratory rate, all those types of things. Well, if that doesn't work as well for the pediatric patient and we have less sympathetic nervous system tone, what happens is we actually see a different response. So uh, our central chemoreceptors in our carotid bodies and our aortic arch, when they witness hypoxia or they sense hypoxia, and we'll draw that in blue here. So this is the chemoreceptor sensing hypoxia, is that chemoreceptor actually favors or send a sig sends a signal to the medulla that favors vagal tone in order to reduce the amount of workload that we see, so in order to reduce MVO2 and attempt to manage some of the hypoxia that we're seeing. So one of the other critical pieces here is that in the setting of hypoxia, so when we see hypoxia, our central chemoreceptors promote 
vagal stimulation here. So not only does the body typically prefer or we have a favoring of the parasympathetic nervous system tone, when we have hypoxia, what we actually see is a favored parasympathetic nervous system response. So we actually get a heightened or a more aggressive parasympathetic nervous system response in these settings, which will create a situation where the patient is more prone to bradycardia. So the third piece here that is relevant is that when we see hypoxia, so in hypoxic settings, the central chemoreceptors actually send signals to the vagus nerve to increase tone. So hypoxia leads to an increase in central chemoreceptor tone, which preferentially increases parasympathetic nervous system, and in this case, specifically vagal tone. So if we think about what the consequence of that is, if we have an increase in vagal tone, we know that the parasympathetic nervous system is going to activate our M2 receptors in our pacemakers. And what we promote when we activate those M2 receptors or acetylcholine binds to those M2 receptors is opening of potassium channels. And what this opening can do is lead to membrane hyperpolarization. And the consequence of that would be bradycardia. So a slower response. If I've hyperpolarized my membrane, we have a slower response. And as a result, I can't have as quick of pacemaker firing and I can end up with bradycardia. So if we go back up here to our cells, we know a couple things are happening. I have reduced calcium pump function, so less calcium is making way into the cell. I have less efflux of sodium, less influx of potassium because my sodium potassium pump isn't working. And then we are preferentially opening our potassium channels on the cell, which will promote efflux of potassium and can lead to not only hyperpolarization of the cell, so as we're moving potassium out, we can see hyperpolarization, but we also have an increase in intracellular sodium content, which is going to impair the ability to get back to our normal resting membrane potential or repolarize the membrane, all of which are going to promote less activity in that cardiac muscle and the cardiac pacemakers. So we're going to see bradycardia. We're going to see uh, bradycardia for these patients. So if we recap what the big problems are, are here is one that we see what we typically see in hypoxia. We're going to see a reduction in ATP production, which means our sodium potassium pump are not going to function properly, which means our calcium pump is not going to function properly. And as a result, we're going to see an increase in intracellular sodium, an increase in extracellular potassium, and we fail to repolarize, which is going to decrease the ability to have an action potential and lead to a slower heart rate. The other issue that we're going to see here is failure of the calcium pump, which is going to decrease troponin binding and will lead to slower action potentials, furthering our potential for bradycardia. And one of the other key pieces here is that the, the pediatric patient has an underdeveloped sympathetic nervous system. So if the sympathetic nervous system is underdeveloped, then the parasympathetic nervous system is favored. The other issue that exists is when we have an underdeveloped sympathetic nervous system, it's more prone to hypoxia. So it's susceptible to hypoxia and can function um, less effectively under hypoxic conditions. And then the other piece is because of this makeup, when we see hypoxia, the central chemoreceptors are actually much more likely to trigger the medulla to have a parasympathetic sympathetic response. So we end up seeing a parasympathetic response in these patients rather than a sympathetic nervous system response. So we trigger the parasympathetic nervous system for these patients and get increased vagal tone, which is going to activate M2 receptors within the heart, promote hyperpolarization. So we actually get potassium shifting out of our cells, which promotes hyperpolarization. And we have less ability to generate an action potential, which will lead to bradycardia. So for these patients, when we think about the bradycardia, this is not typically cardiac related. So the problem is not often related to the heart itself. It's related to the hypothesis and your number one treatment goal for these patients should be correction of the hypoxia, so correction of the lack of oxygenation so the ATP pump can function, so that we do not have stimulation or uh, central chemoreceptor stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system, and we reduce hypoxia on the sympathetic nervous system so it can increase its function. We think about the problem for the pediatric patient. As soon as we lose this heart rate, we already had fixed and impaired stroke volume. Cardiac output will fall rapidly. So these patients will typically compensate until we start losing heart rate, and we will dramatically lose cardiac output is that heart rate falls, which is one of the reasons why the suggestion is in pediatric patients or those without secondary sex characteristics that we consider starting CPR when the heart rate is less than 60. They simply don't have the functions necessary to maintain output if we have a fixed stroke volume and a falling heart rate.